Hello, everyone. I am so excited to have you all here today. My name is Anna Volker, and I'll be your host for this evening. I am the coordinator of outreach for the Ohio State University's Department of Astronomy and for CCAP, which is our Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. I've just asked um, folks in the chat if they'd like to share where they're coming from today and what they're dressed as. And I see we have the ghost of Pluto, Counselor Troy, Captain America, among many others joining us today. As you can see, I am here as uh, Lieutenant Commander Data on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. And we'll be talking a lot more about the details and the science of Star Trek in the uh, minutes to come. Uh, to start off the event, I do want to give everyone a few accessibility reminders. If you are using the live captioning services, please use your computer as opposed to a phone because the phone is not compatible with the captioning when we have the chat turned on. I also recommend using a computer or a desktop if you are using our ASL interpreting, which will be available throughout the evening. We'll start off with some Halloween fun facts and trivia related to astronomy, and then we'll have some opening remarks from our department chair, Dr. Todd Thompson, and then we'll move into exoplanet discussions from some of our graduate students. So I just want to say I'm so excited to have everyone joining us this evening. I think this will be a really fun program. So to start things off, I'm going to go ahead and showcase some of the costumes that have already been submitted for our costume contest. So as most of you know, tonight, uh, in honor of the close proximity to Halloween, we are hosting a very special costume contest, and we are accepting submissions through midnight on Halloween because we're just spooky like that. So you can submit your pictures anytime between now and midnight on Halloween. However, we do have a few submissions that we've gotten so far. So I'm gonna go ahead and start showing off some of our wonderful participants this year so far. So we have a big sci-fi theme. As I've mentioned, you do not need to do sci-fi, but we do have special prizes specific, specifically for sci-fi costumes. Uh, so we have here Miranda Lawson from the sci-fi video game Mass Effect 2, sent in by Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. And a Star Trek officer sharing the deck with me, uh, sent in by Priscilla, uh, ready to explore strange new worlds. We also have a Doctor Who Dalek sent in by the Dunhams, uh, right alongside Darth Vader, who, as any good Star Wars fan knows, is accompanied by his loyal, loyal, uh, loyal pals, the Rainbow Unicorn and the Witch, as is classic for Darth Vader. I really love that about that photo. We also have some very creative uh, costumes sent in about advocating for the preservation of our dark, dark skies. Uh, this costume was sent in from Rayon with an explanation that the, the design is meant to highlight the inappropriate and excessive use of artificial light and is advocating for the protection of the night skies because 80% of the world's population now lives under this sky glow and that actually interferes with the natural environment. So if you're interested in learning more about dark skies, uh, you can actually go to darksky.org to learn about how you can be an advocate for preserving our dark skies, which helps astronomers as well as the natural environment. One cool fact about this is he actually has a smartphone hooked up to it where his voice is translated into light, the light from his phone to represent the use of artificial light. So some very creative entries for sure. This one is a personal favorite of mine, sent in by Kendall. She is seen here with her alpaca, Noel. Kendall is a SpaceX astronaut, and Noel is outer space. <laughs> Noel is wearing a, uh, a, on Noel's neck, we have a painted view of what astronauts Bob and Doug saw of the Earth on the historic SpaceX launch to the International Space Station. Noelle's body is painted with stars of different sizes to represent varying brightness. On her head, she is fashioning a satellite, and over her tail is a representation of celestial bodies, such as a shooting star. So thank you so much, Kendall, for this incredibly creative and awesome entry. We also have with us today Wally and Eve, uh, sent in uh, by Laura. So thank you so much, Laura, uh, for sharing your cute cute robots with us, uh, really excited about this entry. And last but not least, we have Khan, which I think is the only way you can, you can say this costume. 
Uh, and this one was sent in to us by Gail. Thank you so much, Gail. So as I mentioned, there's still time to participate and I encourage you to do so because we're giving away two free telescopes as well as a book all about the physics behind the Star Trek universe. So moving on to some trivia for everyone, I'm going to go through a couple trivia questions just as folks are filtering into the room um, to give people a little more time before we start our official talks. So this year, the full moon falls exactly on Halloween. This is the first time this has happened in A, six years, B, 36 years, C, 76 years, or D, 106 years. So I'd like you to please take a moment and write your guesses in the chat. So how many years do you think it's been since we've had our last full moon? And I'll make sure I have the chat open here so I can start to see the guesses pouring in. Uh, so I'm gonna see a couple different guesses here and I will reveal the answer now is C. It has been 76 years since we've had a Halloween full moon. So it's been quite a long time since the full moon. And in fact, if I can actually, um, oops, go back here. Um, yeah, NASA does not expect another one for quite a few years still to come. So I'm actually just gonna go back here. Um, one second, there we go. Um, so yes, they don't expect another one until 2039. Awesome, thank you so much for those wonderful guesses. Uh, so next up, I'd like to share the fact that NASA has released the spooky space sounds from Halloween in 2017. And this is a compilation of various sounds from space. So I'm going to play one of these sounds and then have you all guess what you think you're hearing. Okay, now I'm gonna give you some options. So, do you think that was A, the sound of sonified lightning on Jupiter? B, radio waves from Saturn? C, plasma waves recorded by the Van Allen probes? Or D, was that a Martian earthquake? Put your guesses in the chat. See many, many guesses pouring in all over, all over. Uh, and the answer, give you a couple more seconds. They're still coming in, still coming in. <laughs> all right, and the final answer is, it was B, radio waves emitted by Saturn. So congratulations to anyone who guessed B. You're actually listening to radio emissions coming off of the planet Saturn. However, all of the other sound options that I shared are real NASA spooky space sounds that you can listen to if you go to go.osu.edu slash spooky space, which is probably one of the best URLs we've shared so far. And last but not least, we'll do one more trivia question for you all before I turn things over to our opening remarks from Professor Thompson. Uh, one of my favorite nebulas for the spooky season is the Witch Head Nebula, which is shown here on the right. I'm displaying a picture of the Witch Head. Uh, the hat of the witch is supposed to be on the top here. And then she has this very big nose and lips and a protruding chin. So you can try to look closely and you can see the head of a witch in this image. So my question is as follows, which of the constellations can this nebula, this witch be found in? Is she in A, Orion, B, Cassiopeia, C, the Big Dipper, or D, Leo the Lion? So I'll pause here for another minute and let the guesses start coming in. all spread across the board. I love it. A, A, B, C, D, D, D. I'll give you one more second to cast your final votes. And the answer for the Witch Head Nebula is A, the Orion constellation. She's located right at the bottom right-hand corner of Orion. So, 
That concludes our opening astronomy, astronomy trivia. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Professor Todd Thompson to welcome you all to today's event. Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to see you here today. This was about the best I could do uh, with my Halloween costume. Uh, but I thought it was the best I thought I would try. Um, so I'm sure I've already seen some uh, Halloween costumes on uh, Facebook and they look absolutely fantastic. And I knew that I was not gonna be able to hold a candle. So I went with the, with the ski theme. Um, I am the interim chair uh, of the astronomy department for this year. And it is my uh, delightful job uh, to welcome you tonight. Um, as many of you know, some people might be, some people might be new. We have uh, absolutely a remarkable uh, astronomy department at Ohio State, um, partly because of our excellent graduate students. Um, you're gonna hear from uh, two of them. Uh, Romy and Samson are gonna be discussing aspects of uh, extrasolar planets, um, their detection, uh, life in the universe and upcoming next generation missions uh, to search for them. Um, but we're also outstanding uh, in our uh, outreach and engagement events. Um, uh, we have Anna here, who's uh, um, who's who's handling this whole uh, this whole thing, and uh, many of our outreach events. And we have a lot of them. Um, so if this is your first time tuning in, I really want to uh, encourage you to come back. Um, I also want to encourage you to um, consider. Uh, giving to the Ohio State uh, Astronomy Department's just general funds, um, which allow us to um, put on a lot of these, um, a lot of these things for you. If you enjoy space uh, like we do, um, uh, then uh, uh, it would be great to have you back um, and it would be great for you to bring your friends and it would be great to, for you to advertise. Um, and here's a way that you can get um, more involved. Uh, there's a form here that you should have uh, access to, which will allow you to sign up um, for more uh, information um, on the many events um, uh, that Anna and Wayne and the faculty and the graduate students here um, at Ohio State have to offer. And uh, we love seeing people um, and we love talking to you about space. Um, so that was it. That was all I wanted to say was extend my welcome. Um, thank you for being here and uh, go ahead and uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll also share that if you are new and this is your first event with us, but would like to continue getting emails, we do have a Friends of Ohio State Astronomy and Astrophysics or FOSA email list. Uh, and so if you're interested in signing up for that, if you're not already on it, you can access that in the chat as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our exoplanet speakers. Starting off is none other than Princess Leia, AKA Romy Rodriguez Martinez, who is joining us as a PhD student from Ohio State. Romy, the floor is yours. Hi Anna, thank you um, for the introduction. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. And can you see my notes? We cannot. Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone, <laughs> I hope you're doing great. My name is Romy Rodriguez and I'm a fourth year graduate student here at Ohio State University in the astronomy department. And today I will tell you about the fascinating story of extrasolar planets or exoplanets and their role in the search for life in the universe. So um, for millennia, humanity has wondered whether we are alone in the, in the universe. And this is arguably one of the most important questions uh, in history, and its answer will have a really tremendous impact on science and on society in general. And we still don't know the answer to this question, but we are now living in a really exciting time where uh, we have the technology to know this answer in the next, perhaps in the next few decades. And moreover, um, we have already started to answer uh, some really key questions that are, are giving us hints as to the answer, um, such as what is the fraction of stars uh, with planets in the Milky Way and how many habitable planets are there? And also what will signs of life uh, look like once we find them? And as for the first question uh, for the number uh, or the fraction of stars 
in the Milky Way with planets, we know that statistically speaking, every star in the galaxy has at least one planet. And this is something that we have inferred from exoplanet surveys and missions that I'll discuss in this talk. Uh, but this implies that our Milky Way galaxy is teeming with exoplanets. And so we don't know if life exists yet, um, but we do know that the universe is really vast and um, there are hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy alone and hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. And so the universe is rife with exoplanets. And uh, if we also consider moons, um, which we know in the solar system vastly outnumber planets, then the potential abodes for life are almost infinite, right? And then there are the building blocks of life. We know that all the elements and molecules that uh, make up our bodies and other organisms on Earth are found everywhere in the galaxy. Um, stuff like carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and water, which life needs to exist, are ubiquitous. And um, finally, there's the element of time. The universe is 13.7 billion years old, which means that life has had plenty of time to, to emerge and to even develop advanced technology. And so the raw ingredients are there. And if we combine them all together, then the logical conclusion is that we can't be the only ones and things must have come together somewhere uh, at some point. And so, if we believe that life exists elsewhere, um, how do we begin uh, searching? And so there are three main ways that we are seeking to answer this ancient question. Um, the first is through the exploration of the solar system. We've been sending satellites and robots and flybys um, to Mars and other places in the solar system since for, for more than uh, almost a century now with the goal of maybe not finding intelligent civilizations, but perhaps microbial life um, in the surface of, of some of these uh, planets. And then the second way is called the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI for short. And this is, um, uh, this enterprise is also very old and it consists of basically listening to the universe in the radio to in a, in a particular part of the radio uh, uh, frequency where we know the universe is quiet. And so if we hear things in that part, we probably can attribute it to, to life. And the third way, and which will be the focus of this talk is through exoplanets, which are planets orbiting stars other than the sun. Um, so this is a beautiful animation of a star that's very near and dear to our hearts, the sun. And this is a video captured by NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory during the 2012 uh, transit of Venus. And you'll see that as Venus moves across the face of the sun, it is blocking a significant amount of light that we can see. And even though we cannot observe other stars with the same level of detail, where here we can see the beautiful surface features of the sun, we can use a similar idea to search for exoplanets, and we call this a transit detection method. So basically, when a planet passes in front of its star, it blocks out a tiny fraction of light um, that we can measure as a tiny dip in its uh, light curve. And when those di dips happen at regular intervals, then we can infer that there's something orbiting that planet, and that something is a planet. And this is this method is the most prolific way of detecting planets um, today. Um, so in this part of the talk, I wanna tell you about three missions in exoplanets that have revolutionized the field or will revolutionize it in some way. And I'll start with a Kepler mission, which you may have heard of. Um, so Kepler was launched in 2009 and it was a statistical mission with the goal of uh, detecting or finding the frequency of Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars using the transit method. And it looked at a small region in the sky about the size of your outstretched palm in the constellation Cygnus. And it stared at this region for four years without blinking, searching for exoplanets. Um, now it looked at something like 500,000 stars in total, and it helped confirm uh, thousands of exoplanets. Um, and it, 
when it launched in 2009, we only knew of only um, 300 exoplanets. And now after Kepler, that uh, Kepler brought this, this number to 2,600 um, exoplanets. And so here I'm showing in the center, the field of view of Kepler. And this is four years after, the, after um, it was observing. And you can see every colored dot in this image represents a planet uh, or star with a planet and they are color coded by um, the size of the planet. And you can see that there's a huge diversity in the sizes of the planets that Kepler found. So here I'm showing a histogram uh, showing the distribution of sizes uh, of the planets found by Kepler. And you can see that these two bars, the largest bars, uh, correspond to planets between one, roughly 1 1.5 and 4 Earth radii. And so, and these are the most common type of planet in the universe, in the galaxy. We call them super Earths because they're scaled up versions of Earth. And this is one of the most uh, major discoveries uh, from Kepler, actually, because this is something that we don't have uh, a planet like this in the solar system, but they're very common everywhere in the galaxy. And um, Kepler also opened our eyes to a staggering diversity of exoplanets in a large range of masses, orbits, and compositions. It, um, it has revealed an enormous number of planetary systems, some of which look nothing like, like our own, and um, in both in their number of planets and their architectures. Um, so here I'm showing, uh, this is supposed to be an animation of, um, of the, all the, the multi-planet systems that have been found by Kepler to date. And the solar system is shown here in the center for scale. And you can see how they, the, they range in, in you know, number of planets and sizes of planets. And, and there's also a huge range in the temperatures. Um, so, um, so yeah, a huge diversity in, in exoplanets. And then another mission that is also already transforming our understanding of exoplanets is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, um, which was launched in 2018. Um, and Kepler, Kepler was assigned to search for Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. Um, but the, the stars that Kepler saw were mostly very far away and faint, and therefore they were not amenable for follow-up observations. But uh, TESS is changing that because it's focusing on stars um, that are bright and nearby. And we care about those stars because they are easier to observe. And so we can further study uh, all the candidates that TESS is finding. <laughs> And TESS is also going to find uh, a few planets uh, in the habitable zone of their host stars. And so I am showing here uh, a picture of a, of a system with the sun in the center and three planets. And one of them is in, in a region, in a, in a green region that we call the habitable zone. And basically this is a region around a star where the temperature is not too high or too low, but just right for liquid water to exist in its, in its center. Um, and outside this region, if the temperature would be too cold or it would be too cold and so water would freeze and interior to that region, water would um, evaporate. And so we call this region the Goldilocks zone just because it's not too cold or too hot, uh, but just the perfect temperature. And if, the, if there's a planet that happens to be in this habitable zone and also um, is rocky like the Earth, then we call that planet habitable. It doesn't have to do whether uh, with how, if it looks like Earth, we don't know that, but uh, it's a start. And so, and so thanks to Kepler and TESS and other missions that I don't, don't have time to mention, we've already uh, detected 62 potentially habitable exoplanets, and some of them are actually very close. Um, so the nearest one is Proxima Sen B, which is orbiting our nearest star. And then there's uh, a dozen others that are within, you know, 100 light years um, as well. And here I'm showing, um, I just really wanted to show this animation because it's so pretty, of um, these cartoons showing 
some artist illustrations of some of the habitable planets that we have found so far. The first one actually in the, in the habitable zone, it was Kepler 186F. And it's shown here next to, this, to the earth for scale. Um, it's actually hard to tell <laughs> which, which one is the earth in these illustrations, but um, you can see that they're all very similar in size and probably in mass uh, to earth. And so um, they're probably rocky and they are also in the habitable zone of their, of their host stars. Now, unfortunately, even the closest habitable planets are still too far away for us to be, for us to visit them anytime soon. Uh, but besides studying their composition and temperature, we can use instruments to determine the chemical composition of their atmospheres. Um, and so here I am showing a, a spectrum of the earth. So this is some, this is, what the what aliens would see if they were looking at the earth and they uh, split the light into its its constituent colors um, and so you can notice that this spectrum is actually not a straight line but it has like chunks uh, or parts where it seems like some light has been removed and that um, those dips are places where molecules and, and elements have absorbed light of a specific color and because each element um, or gas absorbs a specific set of colors, that can be used as a sort of fingerprint to identify the gas. And so if they looked at Earth's atmosphere, they would notice that there is, um, there's a lot of oxygen, there's a lot of water, and they would also see trace amounts of, of carbon dioxide and things like that. And oxygen is, is what we call a biosignature, and this is, this is a gas that accumulates in the atmosphere of a planet that can only be produced by life. And, um, and so it's, and, and the reason is because for oxygen in particular, oxygen is reactive. So it shouldn't be in the atmosphere at all. And so its presence is telling us that there's something that is constantly replenishing it. And that is an earth, on earth, that's, those are plants and photosynthetic bacteria that produce oxygen. And we also produce carbon dioxide that, and ozone that pollutes the, the um, atmosphere. And so um, if aliens were smart enough to build a telescope to see this, they would probably be smart enough to know that some of these gases are caused by life. And so we can use this idea to look for other planets and search for signs of life. And the question is, well, can we actually do this? And the answer is yes. And this is where it gets exciting. It's that next year, there will be another revolutionary instrument uh, called the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it will launch in March of 2029. It'll have a six meter hexagonal mirror like the one shown here. And it'll observe at visible to mid infrared wavelengths. And this instrument will really play a, a fundamental role in the search for life as it will be able to detect biosignature gases like oxygen and water and things like that. And these, um, but I will say these kinds of observations can only be made on the brightest and nearest stars, which is why we need a telescope like TESS and why TESS is sort of the mission link between Kepler and James Webb, because it's going to provide all those, identify all those like tasty, tasty habitable planets um, so that James Webb can go and, and look at them and, and search for signs of life. And so what will life look like when we find it? It's probably not going to look like this or like this. It's going to be a little bit more boring, probably. It's going to look like this spectrum of Titan's atmosphere uh, taken by Cassini. And um, we're probably going to see some really interesting gases that People are going to debate about it, um, about its origin for, for perhaps years, uh, but this is probably our best ch chance uh, for finding life elsewhere in the following uh, decades. And there are many other uh, missions coming online, um, but in summary, we're living in an incredible time and the future of exoplanets is very, very bright. So thank you for your attention. Amazing. Thank you so much.
We do have a number of questions for you, but we're going to hold them until the end. And then we'll do question session between you and our next speaker together. So if you have questions for Romy, please put them in the Q&A uh, and we'll do our best to get to all those uh, at the end here. Uh, so next up, we have Samson Johnson, also joining us from Ohio State's PhD astronomy program. Welcome, Samson. Hi, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm super stoked by all your costumes. I feel bad I was not able to put one together, even as, you know, even as simple as like a skier. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I'm just excited to be here and talk to you all today. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and here we go. So uh, as Anna mentioned, I'm a graduate student at the uh, Ohio State Department of Astronomy. And today I'm gonna to be talking about some work I did uh, predicting what the uh, future uh, Roman Space Telescope is gonna teach us about free floating planets. Um, so it's getting close to Halloween and I wanna start off by taking you all to you know, one of the darkest, spookiest places in the universe. Um, this here I'm showing a video of a, a, a small planet or a, a gas giant planet floating by itself through the Milky Way. Um, and as it flies past us, we can see there's no host star that, you know, has this, uh, that this planet orbits. So uh, these objects uh, could be very numerous in our galaxy and we'd have no way to find them. Uh, but first, or we'd have no way of knowing right now. But to start us off, uh, let's think about where they might come from. So objects like this might form similar to stars. Um, so how stars form is uh, in, you know, large clouds of gas, like I'm showing here, a star forming region. Um, and these large clouds of gas collapse into uh, basically stars. Um, and what free floating planets could be are really just the lowest mass stars that form, um, basically the smallest cores um, that, that uh, condense out of these giant gas clouds. Uh, an alternative way that we could get free floating planets is that they form in protoplanetary disks around a host star, but are later ejected. So here I've got a picture of an artist's rendition of a protoplanetary disk um, around a, a central star. Um, and what could happen is, you know, this uh, planet formation um, is a, a messy process, as I'll show you in a second. But also as the star evolves and loses some of its mass, it might lose some of its planets. Um, so here, as I said, star or, uh, planet formation is a very messy process. And I'm going to show you a video of, of that from Sean Raymond and his work in 2012. So here on the horizontal axis is the separation between some planetary bodies and their host star. And then the vertical is the eccentricity. We can basically ignore the vertical. Just note that there's you know, a modest number, maybe tens of objects in the inner part of this uh, planetary system. There's three large planets further out. And then there's a bunch of minor bodies uh, much further out beyond the three planets. And we'll see that this uh, relatively young planetary system, it's only 40 million years old, is gonna quickly dive into chaos. So here, as the video plays, we see the orbits starting to move around a bit, but all of a sudden they jumble up and everything gets thrown out. Um, all of the inner bodies are thrown out, almost all of the outer bodies are thrown out and only two of the large planets remain in the system. So this could be a source of very low mass free floating planets. So uh, the thing about uh, free floating planets is they're not luminous like stars. Stars are bright because they have fusion ongoing in their core and that produces energy which they emit as light. These objects are low enough mass that there's no fusion going on, so they're effectively dark. So uh, all we know about them is that they're massive and they emit almost no detectable light. So how will we find them? Well, the key trick is something called gravitational microlensing. So uh, gravitational microlensing is a phenomenon that comes about from Einstein's theory of general relativity and from the presence of gravity. Uh, of these objects. And what happens is when you have a massive body in space, it actually bends the space around the object. Um, and this bending actually can change the path of light. So here in an animation, I've got uh, a star and then it's surrounded, you can see the space bending around it through a grid and then a, a trajectory of light. So without you know, this effect, the light would just have a straight path, but because it's passing close to the star, it actually gets curved um, due to this, uh, deflection of space, or it gets deflected by this curvature of space. So how can we, uh, so we know that free floating planets can be detected by gravitational microlensing. Um, and how we're gonna do it is using the Roman Space Telescope. 
So a lot of these animations come from the, the NASA team and they've just done a beautiful job. So I just like to show them off because they're, you know, super good. This like beauty uh, shot of, uh, of Roman um, going up in space. And it's, uh, Roman is a 2.4 meter telescope. Um, that's just one big monolithic mirror. Um, and it's gonna do a lot of amazing stuff, which we're gonna talk about. But first I'm gonna go over the basics of micro lensing. Um, it's very different from the transit method or really any other planet detection method. Um, and it's sensitive to both bound planets and free floating planets. Um, so we're gonna just focus on the free floating planets and then we can talk about the bound planets later if you want. Um, so to dissect a microlensing event, here I've got an image uh, showing uh, the Roman Space Telescope on the left, which is gonna be our observer, which we need to care about. We need to care about our source star, which is on the far right um, here in orange. And then in between them, uh, we've got a lens, a lensing object. So here uh, we can see that light from the source star is deflected around the lens and observed by Roman. And what this uh, effectively does is uh, brightens the uh, increased area, magnifies the source star, making it look brighter for a short period of time. The thing about a microlensing event though, is that the source and the lens need to be near perfectly aligned, almost to like a, roughly a millionth of a degree. So they have to be almost perfectly aligned, making these events extremely rare. So what we wanna do with Roman is maximize our chances of observing one of these events. So here, uh, then the, another thing to keep in mind, well, it doesn't matter. Um, well, we can talk about it later. Um, so here I'm gonna show you an animation of a, a, rogue, uh, a rogue or free floating planet uh, microlensing event. So same setup, we've got Roman on the left, the source star on the right, and then a planet in between them that's gonna move between our, our line of sight with the source star. And what we're gonna see is that because of this bending, we actually get two images of the source star that appear and they effectively brighten during the near perfect alignment and then slowly fade off as the, as the free floating planet leaves our line of sight with the source star. So I'll let this play a couple times. Um, and I'm actually gonna look at the Q and A to see if there's any questions about microlensing before we move on. Um, okay, I, I'll answer those questions later. They're good questions, but we'll talk about them. Okay, so awesome. So uh, let's now take a look. So we're now gonna uh, pause this and we're gonna look from the perspective of Roman. So we're gonna be looking uh, down the line of sight of Roman towards a source star in this next video. So here, imagine you're looking from Roman. Um, here, this central dot is our lens star or our lensing object, which is a free floating planet. And then we're gonna see the source star move from left to right. And we're gonna see these images split. One's gonna go up here, and then one's gonna trace out this bottom path. And on the bottom panel, we're gonna be tracking brightness as a function of time on the, on the horizontal axis. I think it's covered up by the video uh, play bar. Um, but here, let's, let's watch this happen. So uh, we see the, the source star appear on the left, and as it starts moving, we see the two images start to split. We see one on the upper part, we see one on the lower part. And because these images uh, actually have a just basically a greater surface area, it causes a magnification. Now I sort of cheated, uh, or this is a, this is a semi, this is a, an animation for a binary lensing event. So this would be the case for a bound planet. So here, this is the, the planet in question. And then, but, and all that means is that there's this extra spike. So if we ignore that spike, we'd expect to see the same shape for a micro lensing event for a free floating planet. The thing to keep in mind about a micro lensing event is uh, just a small fact that a lower mass lens will have a shorter uh, duration uh, microlensing event. So the duration of the event is from basically when it starts to brighten to when it's back to normal brightness um, is a, a main observable of the microlensing technique. And it's, uh, again, it can help us quantify how massive the lensing object is. Um, so moving on, um, let's plan my videos twice for some reason. So as I said, these events are really rare. rare and that we need to wait for this extreme, uh, extremely close alignment between our lensing object and our source star. So where Roman is gonna look is towards the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy of uh, the Milky Way is one of the most stellar dense uh, regions um, that we know of in the galaxy. It is the stellar, most stellar dense region in the galaxy. And so by monitoring a large number of stars, uh, we will see, uh, um, we can try and capture as many of these you know, chance alignments as we can. Um, the other thing about it, though, is we want to have as big a field of view as possible. We want to look at as many stars as possible at once, and that's Roman specialization. So here, uh, the next video, 
uh, here it's going to start off by showing a pretty famous image or a pretty famous um, uh, object in the night sky that pillars of creation first as a ground based image and then it's going to play into uh, a Hubble Hubble's view the Hubble Space Telescope's view of the pillars cre of creation a much higher resolution look but as we zoom out we're going to try and get an idea of how a uh, large Roman's field of view is. And we're gonna keep zooming out, and we're gonna keep zooming out, and we're gonna keep zooming out, keep going, keep going, keep going, until we see uh, a field of view that's nearly a hundred times that of Hubble. So Roman is gonna have the same uh, resolution as Hubble, but over a hundred times larger field of view. So that's why Roman is gonna be, this is the wide field instrument for Roman. It's gonna be one of its uh, key detectors, key instruments in enabling the science that it'll do, especially the microlensing survey. Um, so to quickly uh, talk about uh, a little more detail about the, the microlensing survey that Roman will conduct, as I said, it's gonna be looking at about uh, a very large field of view for a space telescope, about two squared degrees uh, on the night sky. And it's gonna do the, it's gonna look at those two square degrees for six 72 day seasons. And each of these uh, 72 day seasons are gonna be split up over about four and a half years. Um, during one of the seasons, it's gonna monitor, it's gonna observe the fields at a 15 minute cadence. So once every 15 minutes, it's gonna take an image and that way we can monitor the brightness of uh, a very large number of stars um, with, a, with a high time resolution. And it's gonna produce you know, 10 to the eight light curves. So a very large number of light curves and detect more than 30,000 microlensing events. So the work that we did here at Ohio State was simulate uh, what uh, you know, free floating planets might look like to Roman. So here uh, on the right side, I've got two plots, uh, two light curves for um, simulated microlensing events. The top one is for a planet that has roughly two times the mass of Jupiter. And we can see that you know, normal brightening and then un, uh, I guess demagnification um, of the event. And we can see that it lasts a few days. So uh, a number that I forgot to say earlier is that if we had a star as our lens, the microlensing event could last about a month. Um, but as you get lower um, to say like a Jupiter, you know, those last a few days. And then as we get even lower to earth masses, those will last a few hours. So here that's shown in the bottom panel. Um, so this uh, is a microlensing event for a uh, uh, lensing free floating planet that has uh, about the mass of half of that of Earth. So here, M with the little O plus here in the bottom means the mass of the Earth. And so this event, we can see it actually looks quite a bit different and we can talk about that in the Q&A later, but it's uh, high level microlensing phenomenology um, that we can talk about later. Uh, but we can, we are, uh, Roman will be able to detect these planets or these free floating planets. And so uh, I'm actually gonna skip this slide and talk about you know what we can what we predict that Roman will find. So here I've got a plot of uh, basically histograms. So on the horizontal axis, I've got event time scale. So that's the duration of an event. Um, and let's uh, keep in mind that shorter time scales mean lower mass objects, where longer time scales mean higher mass objects. On the vertical axis is basically it's a, a histogram. So in this histogram, it's the number of events with that time scale per bin. Um, so here, if we have, you know, there'll just be more events in this uh, time scale bin for a very high number. And so on the right side, what Roman is gonna observe, uh, this is a, a, you know, a broad arcing curve for the stellar component. These are all the stellar lenses that we expect to detect. And then on the left side, we've got a few different sample distributions for free floating planets. Um, so the blue curve, is based on uh, an upper limit placed on populations of free floating planets from a previous work. And then from that same work, there's this orange curve of what we might expect if their numbers are correct. Um, and then in our simulations, we assume sort of a, a benchmark mass function to describe you know, how many free floating planets are out there. And we can see here this, uh, this wide span of, of detections is actually going to amount to about 250 free floating planet events that Roman will detect. And so by finding these planets, these free floating planets, Roman is gonna teach us about potentially remember star formation. So if we're detecting really low mass stars that are sort of masquerading as free floating planets or planet formation, if we're detecting objects that were previously ejected from their, from their uh, birth systems. Um, so yeah, Roman is gonna teach us actually a lot about free floating planets. And then 
as I said, uh, Roman is going to teach us a lot about bound planets too. So uh, that's a whole nother talk. I think you guys might have uh, that might have been spoken about at an earlier FOSA event, but Roman is going to find a similar number of planets that Kepler did that Romy talked about. So we're going to get a large sample of uh, planets that are bound to stars. And actually, these are really interesting planets because their uh, Kepler was sensitive, was able to find planets very close to their host star, whereas Roman is going to find planets that are much further away. So we're going to get a, a, a broader picture of what planetary systems look like close to their host star and, you know, in the far reaches. And that's going to help us learn about planet formation and a lot of other stuff. And I can't give a talk about Roman without talking about uh, the cosmology that uh, it's going to uh, do as well. So Roman has three big surveys that it's going to do. One of them is the exoplanet survey, and then the other two have to deal with the accelerated expansion of the universe, which again is a whole other talk on its own. But Roman um, is a very exciting mission that's coming up in the mid middle of the decade. It should be launching in about 2025 or 2026, um, and it's going to do a lot of very exciting science. And so I'm going to close off with a, one final cool animation from the, the NASA team showing the Roman logo. And uh, thank you very much for your time and paying attention. Thank you so very much. Thank you. We now have 10 minutes left for a Q&A for our exoplanet speakers. Uh, so I'll start off with a couple questions here for Samson. Uh, Adrian wants to clarify, is it only looking for those free floating objects or other phenomenon as well? Yeah, so, so Roman, I think I sort of answered that in the, the last bit there. So Roman is gonna be looking for a lot of uh, bound planets. The, I think the most interesting stuff that it's gonna teach us about is the bound planets. Awesome. And then when you talked about the micro lensing that it does, uh, Annika asks, would a larger transiting planet or even a star make for better magnification? Um, so yeah, so the, the more massive you are, you can sort of expect to get a higher magnification. Um, so yes, that's a, that's a really good intuition, yeah. Awesome, great. Uh, and then uh, Stefan mentioned that's actually named for former NASA Chief of Astronomy, Nancy Grace Roman. So I think that's a really good thing to point out the, the honorary name. So thank you, Stefan. Uh, and then we have a question here from Kevin uh, for Romy who asks, why was Cygnus chosen as the constellation that Kepler scanned for exoplanets? That's a good question. I'm actually not, not super sure. I think it might be with the, like the richness of the field, like there were probably more, a high concentration of stars there versus other fields, but that's, that's my guess. Maybe Samson or Todd would know, but. I'm blanking too. I think the, the direction of Cygnus is sort of, if you imagine the, the galaxy as a disc, it's sort of perpendicular to the disc. So it's looking at stars sort of similar to what we'd expect around, you know, in the solar neighborhood. Um, that, that'd be my guess. I can't remember the reasoning off the top. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here um, for Samson, uh, which asks, why is Roman's field of view not exactly rectangular like the Hubble telescope? That's a really good question. So what was sort of hidden in that image, so Hubble's field of view is just a little square, where Roman's is a really sort of strange pattern. And that comes from the fact that that strange pattern is actually made up of a bunch of, of 18 smaller squares. Um, and each of those squares is a separate um, array of pixels that Roman is going to use to collect light and measure light from stars. So it's actually sort of a, a pattern of uh, 18 smaller chips um, that make up that shape. Amazing, thank you. And a question for both of you to answer. I uh, will start with Romy. Adrian asks, how did you get interested in this field of exoplanets? Oh, you're muted, there you go. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I majored in physics and when I, at the time, I didn't know that I wanted to do exoplanets, but I, I think it was like all the like news articles about the Kepler discoveries. And then I remember like going on planet hunters and looking at, at light curves that were available for, for people to see. And the, just the idea of like discovering another, another planet outside the, the, the solar system, just like, I was fascinated by that idea. Awesome, thank you. And how about you, Samson? I think very similar. I actually, I think it was in my sophomore or junior year of college when I first learned that exoplanets were like, a thing like I, I had never thought about like planets existing around other stars and once it like clicked it was like oh my goodness there's planets around other stars it was sort of those like 
moments um and it sort of blew my mind and I immediately like I remember imagining like what like kind of like mountain ranges do they have what's the weather like there? just trying to it's easy to associate uh myself you know being on these other planets and thinking about them and I think it's you know sort of inspired me to keep going after them Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a raised hand from Haley Thurston. So Haley, I've just given you permission to unmute. So if you can go ahead and unmute your mic, you can ask your question verbally. Hi there. Um, I, I have a question for Samson. Um, so you talked about a bound planet and, 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 and a free falling planet. What exactly is the difference? Like a bound planet meaning... Oh, sorry, I should, have, I should have said that better. So what I mean by a bound planet is that it's orbiting a host star, sort of like, you know, exactly how Earth is orbiting the sun. So it has a, a star that it's, you know, associated with. A free floating planet has no star. It's just okay. floating by itself through space. But they both orbit, correct? No, no. The, the free floating planet doesn't have anything to orbit. As I said, it's just isolated, um, sort of like we are now, you know, socially distanced from everything else in the, in the galaxy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great question, Haley. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, so next up, we have a question here from Diana, who asks, what does the mass distribution of these free floating exoplanets tell us? So I think that one's directed towards Samson. Yeah. So what it'll tell us, there's a number of different things. Um, the first is that if free floating planets are produced by star formation processes, we would expect to have higher mass ones, a lot more higher mass ones. And those, and that's because star formation, it's really hard to form low mass things, uh, like low mass stars. Those sort of top out, or like most uh, surveys, the lowest mass objects they found in star forming regions are several Jupiter masses. So we might expect those to be more like Jupiter mass ones. Uh, the alternative is that if they were born to, if they were uh, initially uh, formed bound to a star and then later ejected, um, those would be lower mass things. So in dynamical interactions, the more massive thing is sort of the bully and that's gonna you know, you know, dictate who stays in and who stays out. So if you have a big old Jupiter that's moving through a planetary system and tossing all the other members out because they're lower mass, you know, we'd expect to see a lot of low mass things. And those are gonna be objects that have masses similar to Mars or Earth or terrestrial mass things. Um, so by you know, characterizing this mass distribution, if we see a lot of low mass things, we can say, oh, planet formation is really messy. Um, or if we see a lot of you know, more higher mass things, we'll be like, oh, you actually can form a lot of low mass stars um, and teach us about those aspects. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, next up is one for Romy. Uh, the question asker wants to know, does the mass of the exoplanet affect the likelihood that life could be present there? Yes, absolutely. And uh, the reason is because, well, the only place where we know life exists is Earth, right? And so we're trying in our search for life, we're trying to, to find things that are similar as Earth. So that's the holy grail of exoplanets. We're trying to, to find like an Earth 2.0. And we think in general that the, the higher the mass or like above a certain mass, things really aren't, aren't going to be rocky. They're going to be gaseous. And in those planets, it would be harder for maybe, maybe not by microbial life, but intelligent life, you know, like intelligent, like animals would, it would be harder to evolve there if there's no, if there's no land, if there aren't continents and stuff like that. So absolutely. Yes, it does. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have another for Samson. Matthew asks, does microlensing allow you to measure the semi-major axis, axis of the planet uh, or just the mass? Uh, it will give you a, for, for not for, remember, free-floating planets don't have any semi-major axis, but for bound planets, yes. It does give you uh, a, a handle on how separated the two objects are. Um, it's a little more detailed than that, but you can get a, a, a decent guess. And then how many of these floating or non-bounded exoplanets have we found and are any approaching the direction of our solar system? Oh, that's a good, yeah. <laughs> so right now there's about uh, nine, I think uh, almost exactly nine candidate events that look like free floating planets. And those were all discovered from ground-based microlensing surveys. So one of the key parts about Roman is it's gonna be in space and all astronomy is better from space. So it's gonna do a, a better job. Um, None of them are approaching our, our solar system um, as far as we can tell. So the thing to keep in mind is, I should have made a better point about this, 
is that we're uh, very far from the center of the galaxies and we're most sensitive to things almost, you know, right about in the center between us and the center of the galaxy. So most of these uh, free floating planets that we find are gonna be thousands uh, of light years away. So no worries about that. There's no, what's the, the movie called? Um, there's a movie about a, a free floating planet coming in and crashing into earth. And I can't remember the title off the top. Well, it's good to hear. We don't need to worry about that quite at the moment. Uh, we do have, so you mentioned earlier that a planet might start bound and then become free floating. Free floating. Uh, Andrew asks, can you go from free floating to bound? So do free floating pan planets ever get captured by a star? There's a, a couple papers that have looked at this idea um, and it's very hard. It's got to take a, a lot of things have to go right, essentially is the best way to put it. So stars, as they're going through the galaxy, they hardly interact with one another. Um, so it's the, it's the same thing. It's just space is very, very big. And for them to be close enough to like, you know, notice each other is a very, very low probability. Right. But it is, it is theoretically possible. I should say that. And, and look, actually, there's another question to follow up on that. So there's, someone's asking, is there a chance that an exoplanet came close enough to our star, to the sun, that it could actually, you know, start orbiting the sun and then maybe be able to host, host life ultimately? So do you think that could ever be a possibility? Uh, mm, I don't think so. That, that, as I said, like, it's a very low chance. I mean, nothing is impossible, I guess. But uh, it's a good question. I don't think it's, it's a possibility. Is one of the reasons you don't think it's likely having to do with the fact that there's actually so much distance between us and these exoplanets. So they're, you know, the fact that they're actually quite far away, does that factor into your response? Yeah, exactly. And just, as I said, space is just incredibly big. It's hard to, even for me to wrap my head around. So right. the chances of these things happening, yep, very hard. Uh, another question I like here uh, from Chris, who says, what's the opinion of the speakers on the seemingly constant news reporting of Earth-like planets being found? So what are your opinions on that? And this will be our, our final question before we take a, take a few minutes of a break here. So Romy, why don't you start us off? Yeah, um, I think... I think the, the the media is definitely a little bit too loose with their terms sometimes, and I I think it can harm our field a little bit if if every time they discover something that is has a the the mass of Earth, they say it's Earth like, you know, then people can start thinking, oh, you know, they're finding all these Earth 2.0s and actually create more confusion than interest and so that's that's my concern um but yeah and and i think a, a an easy solution would be to call things earth-like instead of calling things like earth-like earth mass or earth size um but yeah that's my opinion that makes sense yeah i think earth-like implies much more than just similar mass so right how about you samson um, I 100% agree with Romy. I think uh, a lot of times media can be very fast and loose and it's, we're partly to blame because of the jargon that we use, like saying something in the habitable zone, Romy and I have, you know, very specific definitions in our mind of like what the habitable zone means, but to someone else it could mean, oh, there's water on there and there's life and people are moving around. You know, I actually talked to uh, a, a, a large fraction of people that I talk to when they see the images like Romy showed of exoplanets that are artist renditions, they think those are actual planets and we have those images um, and they're actually real um, when they're not. They're all artist renditions. When we, you know, detect an exoplanet, it's a little dip in a light curve that happens every like, you know, 30 days. We have, it's a little pixel in, a, in, a, in an image that doesn't look like anything to us. So it's uh, important to keep that in mind um, when looking at those images and, you know, letting imaginations run wild. Right. And I will add that even the way we name planets adds to that because like I can easily see how like someone that has never heard of an exoplanet hearing the word like super Earth and thinking, wow, this is a planet that's like better than Earth. <laughs> um, but for us, it's like Samson says, like we have a very narrow definition or like an idea of what that means. But right. That's a really great point. Thank you. 
Well, we're going to pause here, um, but I will say there are some additional questions in the Q&A. And so Samson and Romy, if you can go in and respond to those by typing, that would be great. If you can type responses to those questions. And if you didn't get your question answered or you have one you're still holding on to, do type it in the chat and we'll try to have our speakers respond that way. Um, but we are going to take a five minute break. So we'll start again at 8.03. So we'll begin our Star Trek panel 803. So we're going to have a five minute break here and then we'll come back with another exciting topic for everyone. But I want to thank you both so much, Romy and Samson, for your fascinating talks and for being with us here this evening. So thank you both so much. Thank you. And thanks for the great questions. Yes, thank you, Anna. Awesome. So I'll see you all in just a few short minutes. Hang tight. Thanks. <laughs>